And finally, we will discuss the main threats to insect diversity in Gibraltar. So in, uh, in the talk that preceded uh, this one, the one given by, by Rian, she introduced us to, to uh, James Walker, who was a really exceptional uh, entomologist and, and field worker, as Rian highlighted. And uh, again, as Rian said, his usual hunting round was within a 23 kilometer radius of Gibraltar, but he labeled everything simply as Gibraltar. Um, and that's, that's a list of publications that, uh, that uh, came about as a result of Walker's collection. So not just by, by Walker himself, but also by some of, of Walker's colleagues and dealing with all sorts of groups, with Coleoptera, with, uh, with the, which, are, which are beetles, uh, the Hymenoptera, which are the, the ants, uh, wasps, and bees, um, also lace wings, and Lepidoptera, which are um, butterflies and moths. And this illustrates uh, one of the problems with regard to Walker's specimens. This is a beetle called Helops calpensis, calpensis because it's named after Gibraltar. But when we look at the type locality, it says two examples only, so he only found two individuals of this beetle, um, and uh, both from the vicinity of Gibraltar, not from Gibraltar itself. And in fact, we have never found Helops calpensis in Gibraltar. So it's named after Gibraltar, but, uh, but it's, it appears that it isn't found on Gibraltar. And in fact, there are other species too that are named after Gibraltar, but aren't found in Gibraltar and never have been found as, as far as we know. In Gibraltar. So anyway, as a result of this, we had to start again from, from scratch. Some of you may recognize those two young bucks. That is a few years ago. So Charlie and I set about uh, collecting uh, beetles. Again, Charlie had already been working on the Lepidoptera, on the butterflies and moths for, for many years before that. And we started building reference collections of insects uh, from Gibraltar. So what do we have so far? Well, we've focused on some groups. There are lots of groups that, uh, that still haven't received any attention, but we know, for example, that we have 130 um, heteroptera, um, shield bugs and, and true bugs so far, probably going to have about 200 in total, about 700 beetles so far. We'll probably, again, reach 900 or 1,000 among the most diverse, uh, diverse of groups on Earth. Flies, about 600 so far, the true flies. Hymenoptera, well, we've only catalogued 59 because they're the, the, we've only worked on the ants so far, the Rian's work, but uh, again, one of the most diverse groups, and there will be over 1,000 species, I think, of Hymenoptera. About 600, it says 530 there, but about 600 species of Lepidoptera as well so far. That's an incredible number of moths. Also some smaller groups, five mantises, about eight or nine um, damselflies and dragonflies. So how is insect diversity supported? Well, fundamentally, habitat diversity is really important. And not just diversity of habitats, but also diversity within habitats. Habitat structure is very important. Insects are small. They exploit very, very tiny niches in some case. And therefore, the more diverse and complex a habitat is, the more species you will find within it. Also, the, the health of habitats, the, the whether or not habitats are in a good state. Adequate representation of all habitats so, so that means not just a great number of habitats, but a, a, a substantial amount of each habitat, especially those that support greater diversity. So what habitats do we have in Gibraltar? Well, we know that most of the upper rock is, is um, covered in this really thick, impenetrable scrub called the Maquis, um, that, which is actually quite, quite low in, in um, insect species. Uh, there are species that are in the Maquis, obviously. In fact, there are species that are found mainly in the Maquis because they, they like shaded and maybe uh, habitats with more moisture. But it's 
the, really, the, the habitats that are really rich in, in flowering plants that support the greatest diversity of insects. And these habitats occur, for example, on, on the, the slopes with, with Garig, the open habitats on, on Windmill Hill Flats, which are absolutely covered in flowers, places like the Great Sand Slopes, which also support species that live in, in sandy habitats and are specially adapted to living on sand. That's another view of, of a sandy habitat on the east side, full of flowering plants. The Isthmus, which would also have been sandy habitat until very recently, that's a, an old photo of North Front Cemetery. The, the habitat there these days isn't as good as it used to be. The Rocky Littoral, again, very rich in fl flowering plants. But insects exploit every single conceivable terrestrial habitat, and there are even insects within our caves and within fissures in the middle of the rock. That's a habitat for insects as well. As I said, they, they, uh, the, many species are very specialized, and a carcass can, can, um, can act as a habitat and indeed almost as, a, as, a, as an ecosystem. So this is a dead gull. You can see all the, um, all the, 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 the flies on it. So it's the flies that arrive first, and they lay their eggs. The, the, the fly maggots feast on the flesh. You begin to get beetles that arrive to eat, eat these maggots. Once the flesh is gone, another suite of beetle species arrive, and these feed on, on keratin, on, on uh, the, the feathers or, or the fur, if it's a, if it's a, a, um, a mammal. And sometimes you will even find dung beetles that are attracted to, to carcasses. So even though we don't have a lot of dung, you will sometimes find dung beetles on carcasses as well. Right, so let's start looking at some of the species that we find in Gibraltar individually. And first of all, let's talk a bit about insects of, uh, of uh, medical importance. Let's get the yuck factor out of the way because um, a lot of people are, are, are find, find the thought of insects quite, uh, quite repelling. Um, they're disgusted by insects, and that is because they associate insects especially with the sorts of insects that, uh, that exploit uh, uh, resources uh, um, associated with humans. But of course, of the vast majority of the estimated 6 to 10 million species of insects worldwide, and that's about 90% of all animal life. Most of them are completely harmless to humans. The true flies, the dipterone, we can see a blowfly there and, and a mosquito, both from Gibraltar, um, are of most interest to medicine, due mainly to their role as vectors of disease. But there are 125,000 species of flies and 106 families of the, these, but only 10 of these families are involved in disease transmission in any way. And in fact, even within those families, very few species um, are involved in disease transmission. So as an example of the 780 mosquito species in Africa, only about 20 are important vectors of disease. I should say vectors of human disease because they might be vectors of disease for other animals. Let's look at uh, a, a recent arrival to Gibraltar, the Asian tiger mosquito. Not native to Gibraltar, of course. None of us had ever seen them here before a few years ago. They're originally from Southeast Asia. That's a, a, a lovely photo, I think, by, by D. Curran. Spreading, they're, they're not just in Gibraltar, they're spreading throughout the world in areas with a suitable climate. They ar first arrived in Europe in 1979 in Albania, first recorded in Spain in 2004, and then Gibraltar only about four years ago. They're active during the day, unlike other native mosquitoes, and they're a nuisance in humid, shady habitats. And although we haven't had issues, medical issues with them yet, they are an important vector of a number of tropical viral pathogens, including dengue, 
chikungunya, uh, including dengue and chikungunya. Okay, move away from, from uh, human disease now, but we're, we're going to talk a bit more about uh, insects that aren't native to Gibraltar but have arrived here. Um, we've got a, an illustration of two different species of, of longhorn beetles uh, here, I think quite beautiful things, uh, Foracantha semipunctata and, uh, and Foracantha recurva. Both Australian species, so they're longhorn beetles, and longhorn beetles are xylophages. That means they don't feed on xylophones, they feed on wood. Um, and for a cantho in particular, because they're Australian, feed on, on eucalyptus, and they were in fact imported to Europe and around the world with wood and trees. Interestingly, the, the species on the, the right, that gives me an extra five seconds, I would say. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's 10 now. Um, so interestingly, one species arrived after the other one in Iberia, and it seems to be displacing the other species. Not the only pest of eucalyptus in this part of the world. Thaumastochoris peregrinus is a little bug. It's a true bug, a hemipteran. And again, this is a pest of eucalyptus, found in Gibraltar very recently. And indeed, it was described very recently. It was uh, described in 2006 from Argentina. It's probably Australian in origin, we, we think, because it, it uh, feeds on, on eucalyptus. And in the short space of time that, since it was described, it's been recorded in, in South and North America, in Africa, Europe, the Middle East and New Zealand, but not yet Australia. Let's talk a bit more about travelers around the world, but this time native species. As I said, insects also migrate. Gibraltar's uh, well known for its importance to migrating birds, but we do witness large scale insect migration in Gibraltar as well. This is the painted lady butterfly, Vanessa Cardui, which is common in Gibraltar. It's widespread globally, actually, found on every continent ex except South America and Antarctica. It's resident in the warmer parts of its range, but it's migratory elsewhere, including large parts of Europe and North America. And here you can see a team from Rothamsted Research conducting research into painted lady migration in Gibraltar, studying whether or not they use a sun compass to find their way to Northern Europe. And there's been speculation for a long time about the nature of migratory movements of painted ladies between Europe and Africa and whether they cross the Sahara. But a study using um, wing-stable hydrogen isotopes in painted ladies to identify their natal origin confirms long-distance movements of over 4,000 kilometers by individuals between Europe and sub-Saharan Africa, which is incredible for an insect. Yeah, in both directions. Uh, mostly south, but some north. Um, so the most famous migratory insect is without doubt the monarch butterfly, um, which is a native to North America. It was actually first recorded in Gibraltar in the late 1800s, and it's colonized its way naturally across the Pacific and the Atlantic. The Iberian population, however, is sedentary, and it's probably entirely introduced in origin. Um, it arrived in Gibraltar in the late 90s, I think it was, and uh, it's well established now. There's a map of, uh, of the migration of uh, monarchs between, um, between North America and Mexico, well known. And there's another map showing how it gradually colonized its way all the way across the Pacific from, from um, uh, North America to the Pacific Island, across the Pacific Islands, and all the way to Australia. An incredible feat for an insect. Dragonflies also migrate. We've got um, the, the, the photographs show two of the three or four species that are migratory um, here in Gibraltar. But even though we haven't recorded this species here, 
it's worth highlighting the globe skimmer, which that article in Science says, tiny dragonfly shatters insect migration record. The species has an extensive global distribution, and it has been shown to cross the Indian Ocean between South Asia, between India and Africa. And its movements coincide with bird migration. So we can see a map there showing the migration of, of this insect and also its global distribution. Given that it can cross the, the Indian Ocean, it's not surprising that it's, fi it's found across the globe. So it crosses between India and East Africa, ranging south to Mozambique. Uses northeasterly winds above 1,000 meters for transports between India and Africa. And there may be a wind-assisted return journey to India as well. And very interestingly, migrant armor falcons may take these as prey during the journey. And in fact, food availability may have shaped such an arduous migratory route for this bird because it's, it's difficult to see how the bird can cross all the way from India to Africa without feeding once. Okay, let's talk about a bit about uh, the incredible diversity that we see among insects here. In the, and this is, uh, this is the genus Sarcophaga, La Mocarda, in, in Gibraltar. Perhaps not the most beautiful of, of flies, but very interesting. Known as flesh flies. And it's a hyper-diverse genus. There are some 3,000 species of sarcophaga known worldwide, with many still being described. They all have very similar morphologies. They're, they're told apart um, uh, mostly uh, by their genitalia, as we will see shortly. But uh, they have very different biologies. So um, some of them might feed on, on dung, others on, on rotting flesh, lots of species actually um, feed on the flesh of recently dead snails. And so far we've recorded 17 species from Gibraltar. And uh, they're, 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 those, those are two examples of the really quite complex genital structures that the males have. And this is what you use to tell them apart. Whenever we talk about diversity of animals, inevitably we talk about weevils a group of beetles, which are one of the most diverse groups of organisms in the world. Almost 100,000 species known, with the family Curculionidae alone containing 83,000 species. That is an incredible number. 160 species known from Gibraltar. And they're characterized by their rostrums, these snouts that you can see on them of varying lengths. And these snouts are adaptations which they use to feed on plants, which they do as larvae and adults. Um, the, the vast, vast majority of weevils um, um, feed on plants. And you can see the incredible diversity that you might be able to witness in a small place like Gibraltar alone. All of those are Gibraltar species. Diversity of weevils is therefore related to the diversity of plants, but a single plant species can support many species of weevil, each with its own specialized niche. There are around 400,000 plant species known to science, and that means that there are probably significantly more than 100,000 species of weevils. An example of a recent arrival to Gibraltar is this incredible Curculio elephas, which uses its incredibly long rostrum to penetrate acorns. It's an important pest of holm oak fruit of acorns, found on oaks, but oaks are largely absent from Gibraltar. And the species has been turning up in our light traps recently, perhaps due to the use of oaks in new parks. And that's a side view, and just look at how beautiful that is, and look at the intricacy of those scales. Another incredibly diverse group of beetles are the ground beetles, the Carabidae. Like the weevils, they're among the 10 most species families of animals. Over 40,000 species of these known again, and most of them are predatory. More than 70 species known from Gibraltar, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually less diverse than expected 
given the diversity of the group in the region, southern Spain is really rich in ground beetles. We have a fairly poor ground beetle fauna, and that is probably um, due to a lack of clay soils. Um, they, they like very humid soil. Um, they're a fairly primitive group. Primitive insects tend to, tend to be associated with humidity, and, and that's probably why there aren't many in, in Gibraltar. Another incredibly um, diverse group of, of insects, in fact, I think that if they were as well studied, studied as the weevils, they would turn out to be more diverse than the weevils, and those are the parasitoid wasps. It says Hymenoptera cuculionoidea, but it's, uh, pa it's uh, no, copy-paste. Um, so they're a hyper-diverse group of solitary wasps, they rival the weevils in diversity or perhaps exceed them. And most are parasitoids of other species. They're the ichneumonoidea, including each other. So they even parasitize each other. That, so that means that the larvae feed on other insects. The ovipositor, that one's got a very long ovipositor, typical of the group, and they use these to pierce other insects and lay their eggs inside them. Very poorly studied in Gibraltar, but a reference collection is underway, and they will turn out to be the most diverse group in Gibraltar. Wasps are, of course, known. The solitary wasps are, of course, known for their, for their parasitism, but they're not the only parasitoids. Um, there are plenty of parasitoids among the true flies. For example, the Tachinidae, such as, such as this um, Pelateria ruficornis here, are a family of, of uh, flies that are parasitoids of other insects, uh, mainly grasshoppers and, and bugs. Again, a very diverse group with close to 10,000 species known globally and more awaiting discovery. And many of them resemble flies that belong to other families. For example, this Pelateria ruficornis uh, from Gibraltar superficially resembles a, a flesh fly. Not the only group of parasitic uh, true flies, this is Ogcodes etruscus, which is a, a small-headed fly, an acroserid. And these are also known as hunchback flies, very rare findings, and they're a group of, the group are parasitoids of spiders. They parasitize spiders. Most species are very rare to observe in the field. Doesn't mean that they're rare necessarily, just that we're not very good at finding them. And they're, in fact, more commonly collected by arachnologists who bring spiders into the laboratory from the field than by dipterists. Another group of parasitic flies are the snail-killing flies, the skyomyzids. This is Euthysera alaris, again from Gibraltar. And the larvae of these snail-killing flies are parasitoids of snails and slugs. And in fact, the flies are considered important in snail and slug population regulation. There aren't many insects that parasitize um, snails and slugs, mollusks, so these are quite interesting. So parasitism isn't just about gruesome stories involving insects eating other insects from the inside. This is a bee fly. This is Bombylius cruciatus, which some of you might have seen hovering in, in midair around Jib. It's a mimic of bees, and the larvae are, in fact, brood parasites of solitary bees. They're the equivalent of cuckoos, so the, the adults will lay eggs in the nests of solitary bees, and these flies will eat the food that the bees collect for their own larvae. Let's look at a few um, beautiful and charismatic species in Gibraltar. This is the the two-tailed pasha, Caraxes jassius, um, very active at this time of the year, easy to see in the botanic gardens. The European distribution is restricted to the Mediterranean, and the strawberry tree is considered its primary food plant in Europe. But in Gibraltar, because the strawberry tree favors acid soils and we have basic soils, the larvae feed on African sandalwood, Osiris lanceolata, instead, and that's the very attractive caterpillar of the two-tailed pasha on, on one side and the strawberry tree on the other. Lots of lepid European lepidopterists are very surprised when we tell them that they don't eat arbutus, that they don't eat strawberry tree, 
here in Gibraltar because it's assumed that that is the true food plant. But although that's the distribution of the species in Europe, um, two-tailed pashas are in fact found throughout Africa, all the way down to South Africa, where you don't find Arbutus, but you do find Osiris. So it's likely that the jump happened the other way around. They feed on other things in, in Africa as well. A, um, one, of our, one of our endemic or near endemic species is this subspecies of the beetle Buprestis sanguinea, which is a jewel beetle that was first recorded in Gibraltar by Champion in 1901, but it wasn't recorded again until Charlie Perez did in, in the 2000s, and the subspecies Calpitana was described in 2006. The larvae feed on joint pine, Ephedra fragilis, and unusually in beetles, it's sexually dimorphic. The male and female look very different, so much so, in fact, that the type specimen is the female, the red one, and the male was originally described as a different species. So that's the 1901 publication. That's the joint pine that it feeds on. And those are the larvae of, of uh, Buprestis sanguinea. Okay, another special um, beetle from Gibraltar, I would say more special even than the other one, is this Lucitanopsis, which has yet to be described. It's a very small subterranean species of rove beetle. It's tiny, it's got no eyes, and it's unpigmented. And it's only known from Gibraltar, almost entirely from one bed in the Gibraltar Botanic Gardens, but also a single specimen from the upper rock, which tells us that it hasn't been introduced to the, to the Botanic Gardens. Particularly yes. <laughs> <laughs> it remains undescribed. And there is, in fact, a second species of, of Lucitanopsis called Lucitanopsis herculeanus, which has not been found again since it was described in 1961. This lives underground, no eyes, never sees the light of day. Neither does this one, Paratyphilus Tristan Canoy, which was described two years ago. So small, extremely small subterranean species of rove, be rove beetle, even smaller than the former. It's a Gibraltar endemic, almost certainly as well, because it belongs to a group of species with very restricted distributions and a very high degree of endemism. They live a foot underground, they don't fly, they're, they're a millimeter long, they're not gonna go anywhere. And in fact, the morphology is so nondescript that only the genitalia are worth illustrating, as these are the only useful features with which to separate the species. They're also so translucent that you can study the genitalia by shining light through the beetle without having to extract the genitalia. This is another special beetle from Gibraltar, Tornaouma bensusani, another subterranean species, also with no eyes, lives around the root of plants, was described from Gibraltar, belongs again to a group of species with restricted distributions and very high degree of endemism, but it was unexpectedly found in Sauda in the same year by the same collector. How it got across the strait, who knows. And this is the way that we, that we find these subterranean species. So um, in order to find these species, these tiny species that live in the soil, we take um, soil samples typically of between 10 and 20 kilos. We put them in a bucket, fill the bucket with water, stir it, all of the organic matter comes up and floats. After a while, when it settles, we collect that all with a sieve, dry it out, put it under a lamp uh, um, for, um, on, on a wire gauze, leave it there for un up to two weeks, and eventually these little beetles emerge and drop into the, the tray with water below. So an arduous task. Some pretty things. Anthaxia scutellaris, a jewel beetle that sits on flowers. The larvae feed on wood again, in pine, in serotonia, in pistacia, among others. And the adults are absolutely beautiful. Another really curious beetle here, um, the, the armored Hispa atra, a type of leaf beetle. It feeds on grasses, the larvae mine within the grass leaves. They're uncommon in Gibraltar, 
mainly in open habitats with grasses, and we don't have many of those habitats. Let's have a look at a very small Lepidopteran now, a small moth called uh, Epicalima mercedella. It's a concealer moth. And you can see from this photograph through a microscope that the wings of Lepidoptera are, are composed of tiny little scales, which you don't really appreciate unless you look at a moth through a microscope. Very intricate beauty. That looks like a wasp. In, fla in fact, it looks like a hornet, but it's a true fly. This is Milesia crabroniformis, crabroniformis meaning um, a hornet like, but it's a hoverfly. It's a type of fly. It's the largest hoverfly of its family in Europe at about two and a half centimeters, and it mimics the European hornet Vespa crabro. The larvae develop in decaying wood and it's uncommon in Gibraltar and indeed generally. Mimics have to be uncommon if they're, gonna, if they're gonna fool other species successfully into thinking that they are what they're not. Another, I think, incredible, pred this time predatory fly, a robber fly called Pogonosoma maricanum. Formidable aerial predators. The larvae are also predatory, they feed on xylophagus, on, on insect larvae that feed on wood. And it's a known predator, the larva of the um, larvae of carpenter bees, of, of xylocopa, among other insects. And I just included here, there we go. If you were wondering what a xylocopa gallery looks like, that's it. That's a little, that's a little carpenter bee filmed by Rian hiding from the rain. Another charismatic species from Gibraltar is the Death's Head Hawk Moth. Popularized by the film Silence of the Lambs, I say the film because actually in the book it's a different species of moth, not the Death's Head Hawk Moth. Called the Death's Head because it's got that skull-like um, uh, marking on, on the thorax. And the caterpillar, which is quite often reported in Gibraltar, is a truly impressive thing as you can see there. And the caterpillars feed on a wide variety of plants. They're a known pest of, of solanum, of, of potatoes. But in Gibraltar, they feed mainly on wild olive, on olea europea. And that's their distribution. Um, the red means that they're present uh, throughout the year, every year, and yellow is only in warm years. And you can see that they sometimes reach Iceland. Okay, this, uh, this beetle should be familiar to many of us. It's Acis acuminata, which is a, a darkling beetle. And it was once extremely common and well known in sandy areas around Gibraltar. In fact, I would say that this is the beetle that most of us in Gibraltar associate with the word beetle. But although it's still common in some habitats, numbers have decreased drastically in others. As I say, this is the black beetle that most of us Gibraltarians remember from our childhoods, but I will ask the question, would any Gibraltarian child recognize it nowadays? And I think the answer is no, which is very worrying. Exactly, yeah, never see them now. Never see them. Yeah. This is an, a, a, another black beetle, but one that most people in Gibraltar um, haven't seen. This is Scarites buparius, which is a ground beetle, look at the carabids that we spoke about earlier. It's very large and it's often mistaken for a stag beetle because of its jaws, but actually stag beetles are very different animals that feed on wood. This is a predator um, and stag beetles are not found in Gibraltar. It's a formidable predator, um, including of darkling beetles such as the Acis acuminata that we saw earlier, but it'll take all sorts of things, um, including the Gibraltar funnel web spider, Macrothele calpiana. Quite fearless. Again, favors sandy habitats, and in Gibraltar, it's only known from the Alameda Gardens. And there's a photo of one hunting one of those darkling beetles. <clears throat> 
Okay, quite an incredible insect there. Um, some of the viewers might think that looks more like a spider, but of course it has um, six legs and not eight as a spider should. And that is, believe it or not, a fly. That is a very highly adapted species of fly called Penicillidia conspicua, and it's a bat fly. It's a parasite of bats. They're an extremely specialized family. They're all um, parasites of bats. None of them have wings. Eyes are reduced or absent in most species. Why would you need eyes when, you're, when you parasitize animals that are active in the dark? They're ectoparasites of, of bats. They feed on their blood. And in Gibraltar, they're found in roosts of Schreiber's bent wing bat. Another blood-sucking fly is Ornithomaya rupes, which is a, a louse fly. This is a very specialized family again. Almost all of them are parasites of birds. The bodies are virtually flat because they're adapted to live between feathers. Again, they feed on blood. And this species is found on crag martins, which we, we spoke about briefly earlier. In fact, they're found on crag martins and no other bird. They're closely related to a parasite of swallows, but they're a different species. And in fact, Gibraltar is the type locality for this, uh, for this species because this species was discovered during studies on um, crag martins that were conducted in Gibraltar during the 1970s. Okay, back to tiny beetles. This is um, Tenidium levigatum, um, barely a, a millimeter long of that. It's a, a feather wing beetle, and the family includes the smallest beetles known at 0.3 of a millimeter. That's the smallest beetles, but there are some parasitic wasps that are even smaller than that. They typically live in leaf litter and decaying matter, and the adults and the larvae feed on fungi, they're mycophilus. They're called feather wing beetles because, as you can see there, the wings are narrow and feathery, they're not membranous, and this tiloptery is actually a feature of insects that are less than one millimeter in size. But these are, are unique among tiloptorous um, insects because they can fold their wings to tuck them under their elytra, un under their hardened uh, wing cases that, that, that typify the beetles. So there are a number of factors that limit the body size of the smallest insects. The relative volume of reproductive and nervous systems, for example, uh, increases by a considerable factor as body size decreases. This is the case in, uh, with regard to male genitalia, for example, which become increasingly important to species identification as insects become smaller and more nondescript. But it's clearest with regard to eggs. So the, the um, females of these feather wing beetles can only develop and lay one egg at a time. Their body won't allow for more than that. And in fact, some species have become parthenogenetic. They've done away with sexual reproduction altogether. Rian spoke to us uh, earlier about um, J.J. Walker's love of Myrmecophilus insects, of, of insects that live in ants' nests. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about those because they, these are Eretmotus tangerianus and Sternochelis acutangulus, both found in Gibraltar. Um, and both are clown beetles, Coleoptera hysteridae. They both have very specialized biologies in that they live in the nests of the ant, Aphenogaster senilis. Um, they eat the larvae, but the ants largely ignore them, probably because they cloak themselves in the, in, in, in the chemical signals that, that ants use to identify each other. 
Very little is known about their larval stages. They're, they're poorly known. And actually, Sternocellus acutangulus was described from Walker's material. He collected some around Tangier, where they seem to be more common than, than on this side of the strait. Rian mentioned earlier um, what an accomplished uh, field worker uh, Walker was, and whereas many coleopterists can spend an entire lifetime in the field and hardly ever find one of these, even in ants nests, he took one of these on the wing in Gibraltar. He saw it flying and swiped it, and, and these are tiny things. <laughs> okay, um, let's talk a bit about lesser dung flies now. I mean, imagine, imagine being a lesser dung fly. It's bad enough being a dung fly, isn't it? But, but these are lesser dung flies, and you might look at that photo and think, but I'm looking at a dung beetle, not a dung fly. But you can see four little things um, taking a ride on the hitching a lift on that dung beetle, and those are little spherocerid flies, lesser dung flies. This is one in particular, actually a fairly large species for the group. This is Pessila somella angulata. It's native to Africa, but also found in South America, and it was recently um, uh, recorded as new to Europe from Gibraltar. Why is it only found in Gibraltar within Europe? Well, it's a specialist of primate dung. It eats primate dung and nothing else. We saw earlier that it's found in South America. It is thought that it is actually native to Africa and it may have made its way all the way across the Atlantic in the slave ships because, of course, we are primates too. That's primate dung covered in beetles. These are little aphodius beetles. That's not Gibraltar, that's the, the middle atlas of, of Morocco. But some of those aphodius beetles are found in Gibraltar as well. And aphodius species are very small scarab beetles. Um, although we're more familiar with the larger dung beetles, such as the, the scarabius that we saw in the earlier photograph, um, actually, Aphodius, these little things, dominates dung beetle communities in Europe. There are about 1,600 species worldwide, all doing slightly different things on piles of dung, and um, over 190 in Western Europe alone. A few species are found in Gibraltar in spite of the relative lack of dung, so um, perhaps dog fouling isn't, isn't such a bad thing after all. Okay, so that's a plant, not an insect, but actually that shows signs of infestation with an insect, with an aphid, the aphid Aplanura lentisci, which infests the lentisk, Pistacia lentiscus, and the insect is absolutely tiny, so within that red leaf, which is the gall, there are loads of these tiny aphids, and it's common in Gibraltar as is another aphid that infests a, a close relative of, of, that, uh, uh, of that plant. This is Pistacia terebinthus. Um, so the, the insect is called Bizongia pistaci, and terebinthus is its primary host. Known in English as a Pistacia horngall aphid, or Agaja de Cornicabra in Spanish. Again, common in Gibraltar. Right, so as, as Leslie told us earlier, um, plant diversity in Gibraltar is high, and that slide just shows some of the very beautiful plants that are found in Gibraltar. Gorgeous as they are, they're not there to please our eyes, they're not interested in us in the, in, in the least. Their one and only function is to attract insects in order to pollinate them. Most of them do so by offering insects something in return, by offering um, uh, nectar to, to, to drink or, or, or even excess pollen to eat. But some plants have taken to exploiting insects. So these are uh, a range of bee orchids that are found in Gibraltar. And that's a photograph also by Leslie Linares of a little Andrina bee trying to mate with a bee orchid, um, Leslie came up with a far better photo than that. 
So they're orchids of the genus Ophrys. They're very diverse in the Mediterranean, which also supports a high diversity of bees. Each species is adapted to pollination by different bee species. They're, they're named after all sorts of insects. Some of them are even called spider orchids and sawfly orchids. They're all pollinated by Hymenoptera. There are six species in Gibraltar. The form of the flower is adapted to mimic its pollinator, more or less, but the mimicry is actually incredibly accurate at the chemical level. It smells identical to the target insect, and not only that, because insect males tend to emerge earlier than females in order to develop their gonads, flowering t is timed before the females have emerged so that all of these randy males are desperate to mate. Okay, so we've, uh, so, so we've, we've looked at uh, some solitary bees, which are the, the, the species that, that, um, that pollinate these, these bee orchids. The honeybees that we're familiar with have nothing to do with the bee orchids. Um, I, th I always find it curious that humans are generally very well disposed towards honeybees, even though they sting. I think that's... I think that's quite incredible, and it's probably due to a relationship with humans that goes back thousands of years. They are, of course, extremely important economically, not because they produce honey by and large, that's a byproduct of their use in pollination in, in crops. They're native to Europe, but wild populations are bolstered by, by beekeeping. And we hear about saving the bees. We need to save the bees. But actually, if we look at honeybees alone, there are more beehives in the world than ever. There are some 90 million beehives in the world at the moment. Yes, there are issues that affect beehives, but that doesn't mean that the honeybee is in any danger. In fact, there are growing concerns about the impact of these artificially high populations of honeybees on other bee species. It's a generalist pollinator too, so unlike all of the solitary bees, which tend to focus on a very narrow uh, number, a very small number of plants to pollinate, they will pollinate all sorts of plants, including invasive plants. And it's the solitary bees that need saving. So a bit more about their possible impact. Um, so there was a review recently, do managed bees have an effect on, on, have negative effects on wild bees? And that found that 53% of studies reported negative effects, with 28 reporting no effect and 19 mixed effects. So on the whole, negative effects. And studies of plant communities reported positive and negative e effects in equal numbers. 70% reported potential negative effects of pathogen transmission from managed bees to wild bees. And although managed bees within the native range had less of an impact on competition with native bees, they were more involved in pathogen transmission. And finally, there are even concerns regarding the genetic integrity of wild honeybee populations. So we'll look at one more insect before we talk about conservation and wrap up. This is the greater wax moth, and I thought I would highlight this because this species, which is a snout moth, is also, and it's also known as the honeycomb moth, lives within beehives. The eggs are laid inside of beehives, and the larvae feed on wax, pollen, honey, and the discarded skins of bee larvae. And they can be vectors for pathogens that affect honeybees. And they're also an, an important economic pest of honeybees. Okay, so conservation. What are the conservation issues affecting um, insects in Gibraltar? Well, I would say actually generally, but especially in Gibraltar where we don't have agriculture, we don't use pesticides, the biggest issue by far is habitat loss. Habitat loss, not just due to habitat destruction, but also due to vegetation succession and the development of the maquis, which Leslie highlighted this morning as affecting plant diversity. 
Plant diversity is so important to insect diversity. And this habitat loss actually has been happening for a long time. Uh, we see there a quote from, from Woley Dodd from his flora of over 100 years ago, where he basically says that uh, the, the western slopes have been, uh, were formerly open to the browsing of goats. Um, they were f a lot more open in their habitat, a lot more species of, of plants. But because of the planting of trees and the erection of the unclimbable fence, um, the taller growths have been encouraged and crowded out much of the undergrowth. And that has continued to this day. So that's, again, a photo we saw earlier in, in Leslie's talk that shows how open the lower slopes were. Management practices as well, um, uh, the, the fire breaks, uh, um, the, the, the fire breaks were, were managed a lot more intensively up to the 1980s, and then you can see that by the 2000s, a lot of them had become maquis, and they supported a high, di uh, a, a high diversity of plants, and we have to assume a high diversity of insects too. This was a really important site for insects. This was the, the old aerial farm, which has now been uh, developed as, as housing. Of course, housing is extremely important, but we have to do our best to conserve those little vestiges of that important isthmus habitat that we still have. This is the, the cemetery. Um, of course, we can't allow the cemetery to, to become overgrown, but, I don't think this is productive either. I don't think this looks good either. I think the cemetery is at its most beautiful when the vegetation is managed and when it's covered in flowers. And of course, we have to be respectful of the dead, but we also have to respect life. And so why should we conserve insects? Well, they comprise over, uh, overwhelmingly, comprise, uh, so, overwhelming proportion of global biodiversity consists of insects, so that's about 90% of animal life, about 80% possibly of life in total. They're essential to the many species of vertebra vertebrate and invertebrate that rely on insects for food and for other services. They're vital to plant pollination, wild and cultivated. They're even important as, gra as grazers. I think that there was a study that showed that 12 to 14% of all grazing in the Serengeti is by grasshoppers. And quite simply, ecosystems would collapse without them, and humans cannot survive without them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith. That was very interesting indeed. Uh, we have time for questions. Do we have any questions from the hall? Any questions? Well, we don't have any questions from, um, from the YouTube channel. Uh, I'll ask you a question, uh, mm -hmm. Keith. I know you've done a lot of work uh, in conjunction with Charlie, Rian, and so on. Uh, with a whole range of insect groups. And I know that ants are uh, particularly interesting uh, for Ian, but what groups do you uh, particularly think are more interesting for, for you and say perhaps for Charlie as well that you specialize in or are particularly looking at in more detail currently? I'm, I'm doing very little insect work currently because it's very time consuming and I don't have time at the moment. Um, I mean, I've, I've, in the past, I've focused most on, on beetles. They're, they're the most diverse group, possibly, with the Hymenoptera. Um, and they are just incredible in their diversity and their adaptations. And uh, I, could, uh, I could talk to you about beetles for a long, long time. Um, so I would say, I would say that uh, the beetles, but also, also the true flies, the diptera, are extremely diverse, some incredible life histories there. So okay. possibly those two groups for me. Okay. Anybody have any comments or questions? Clive? Uh, maybe for your co-author, some of those wonderful photographs, I believe you call them stacking. Can we hear a little bit about how that's done? What equipment, lenses, what is used to do that? I'm gonna hand over to Charlie, yeah, who takes those fabulous photos.
Well, as you know, uh, some of these insects, uh, you've seen the measurements there, they're one or two millimeters small. Uh, the difficulty with photographing uh, insects at such a, a high magnification is that the depth of field is so small that you can only get a fraction of the insect in, in focus. Now, what I use is uh, microscope uh, lenses and a set of bellows to be able to uh, get as close to the insect as possible and uh, between the closest area of focus of the insect and the furthest area of focus of the insect would take about 250 to 300 different photographs which take, which each of those takes a, a bit of the focused area and with a stacking program, all those focused areas will be stacked into one complete image of the insect that shows the, the, the insect as a whole in, in, in focus. It is uh, very time consuming, but very rewarding. The problem is obviously lighting and you have to make sure that you get the right perspective of the insect before you start taking the stack because it takes a, it takes a long time. It would take uh, an hour or two to produce the, the whole range of, of photographs. And then uh, the stacking program can also take up to an hour. And if you have uh, set light, the lighting wrong, you have to start all over again to get uh, the best uh, image as po possible but it is very, very rewarding. I, 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 I was commenting earlier, actually, that, that it, once, once that process is complete, it's actually better than viewing the animal through the microscope, because the, through the microscope, you only see a single plane, whatever, whatever the microscope happens to be focused on. So uh, as an entomologist working through a microscope, you're always used to not seeing the whole animal in effect. You're seeing parts of it blurred and parts of it in focus. And this just allows you to, so even subjects that you might, that you might be very familiar with, when you finally see the entire stacked image, you think, oh, wow, I've never seen it like that. Yeah. In, in fact, some of the photographs that I took for Rian's presentation of ants' heads, those are basically just uh, one or 1.5 millimeters and it actually shows the structure of the head, uh, the hairs, uh, the jaws, and that sort of image cannot be appreciated through a microscope, as Keith has said. Once you get the stacked image, you can see the whole range of focus in, in a picture like that. Is there an upper um, so, so there's, uh, the, the upper limits would, ref would relate to your photographic equipment, but not to the process. So I, I have used that same image stacking software to, to produce uh, photographs of very intricate flowers, for example, or, I mean, butterflies, you, butterflies any, anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that the subject has to be still, and, and often you're there for half an hour or just taking photos. So the, the subject has to be still. Any further questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much, Keith. Thank you. So, so now we have time.